Fiction finalist, Taya O'Brett, The Tiger's Wife, published by Random House. Good evening. The Tiger's Wife is about a young Balkan doctor who's struggling to understand her grandfather's mysterious death through stories about his life. Um, and this passage is about a great hunter, Dadisha the Bear, uh, and about how he becomes what he ultimately is, um, the stuff of legend in somebody else's life. Um, so his sister, who is dying, takes him to the palace museum, to the, uh, to the old Turkish palace. To enter the Pasha's Hall of Mirrors, you had to cross the garden and go down a small staircase to a landing that looked like the threshold of a tomb. A rearing dragon was carved on the tympanum, and a gypsy with a lion cub sat on a small box and threatened to curse your way if you did not pay for guidance. This was mostly for the benefit of children, because both the gypsy and the lion cub were on the payroll of the museum. You would put a groche in the gypsy's hat, and she would say, beware of yourself, and then shove you inside and slam the door. Wary of Magdalena's condition, the family doctor had advised her against going inside, so Dadisha went alone. The first part of the labyrinth was innocent enough, a row of joke mirrors that blew you up and cut you in half and made your head look like a zeppelin, but past that, you would suddenly have the notion of standing upside down and back to front. The ceiling and floor were done in gold tile and carved palm crowns, and the mirrors stood so that every step you took was into an alcove with nine, ten, twenty thousand of yourself. You would inch along slowly, the tiles of the floor shifting and changing shape, the angles of the mirrors slanting in and out of reality while your hands touched glass and glass and more glass, and then finally, open space where you least expected it. Coming around in visible corners, you would occasionally encounter a painted oasis or a mounted peacock in what appeared to be the distance but was in reality somewhere behind you. Then the marionette of an Indian snake charmer with a wooden cobra rearing out of a basket. Making his way through the labyrinth, Darisha, at nine years old, felt that his heart might stop at any moment, felt that even though he was seeing himself everywhere as he advanced, he did not know which one of him was real, and his movement was crippled by indecision and fear of becoming lost, of never finding his way out of the fog. And despite, <clears throat> and despite Magdalena's best intentions, he began to feel the same emptiness that found him in the darkness of his room at home. Every few feet, his face would hit the mirror and leave a chalky stain on the glass. He was crying by the time he reached the Pasha's oasis, a curtained atrium with six or seven live peacocks milling around a green fountain, and beyond it, the door to the trophy room. The trophy room was a long, narrow corridor with blue wallpaper. A tasseled Turkish carpet unrolled down the length of the hall, and the south wall was studded with the shining, mounted skulls of antelope and wild sheep, the broad horns of buffalo and moose, picture boxes of pinned beetles and butterflies, carved perches from which the wide, dead eyes of hawks and owls stared down, the tusks of an elephant crossed like sabers next to a case containing the spiraled single horn of a narwhal, a large swan spread-winged and silent, kiting on a string, and at the end of the hall, the mounted body of a hermaphroditic goat with several photographs of the living animal preserving moments of his life in the Pasha's menagerie to prove that it had not been fabricated in death. The opposite wall was illuminated with lamps that tilted upward from the floor into enormous glass cases where the wild things of the world were posed in agitated silence. One case for every corner of the earth, every place the Pasha or his sons had hunted. Yellow grass and staircase crowns of flat-topped trees painted in the background of a case that held a lion and his cub, an ostrich, a purple warthog, and a small gazelle cowering in a flush of thorns. Dark woods with canvas waterfalls, the mouth of a cave, and a bear standing rigid, paws folded, eyes up, ears forward. Behind the bear, a white hair with red eyes and a pheasant in flight pinned to the wall. A pastel river thick with the foreheads of drinking zebra, kudu, oryx, horns slanting up, ears turned here and there to catch the silence. An evening tableau, bent bamboo forest, green as summer, and a tiger washed with fire standing in the thicket with its face pulled up in a snarl, eyes fixed forward through the glass. 
Young boys are fascinated with animals, but for Darisha, the hysterical dream of the golden labyrinth, coupled with the silent sanctuary of the trophy room, amounted to a much simpler notion. Absence, solitude, and then, at the end of it all, death in thousands of forms, standing in that hall with frankness and clarity. Death had size and color and shape, texture and grace. There was something concrete to it. In that room, death had come and gone, swept by, and left behind a mirage of life. It was possible, he realized, to find life in death. Thank you so much.